Hello and welcome to the Headline Interview. I'm Luke Blackwell and my guest today is Professor Maggie Atkinson. She's the UK's former Children's Commissioner with a huge career in education behind her and she's now the Chair of A New Direction, an organisation promoting children's engagement with art and culture in the capital. Um, Maggie, welcome. I wanted to start first by, as I usually do, asking people about their upbringing. Tell me, where were you brought up and how was it as an upbringing? I was brought up in mining country in South Yorkshire, on the outskirts of Barnsley. Um, I'm a twin, I have a twin brother. And uh, it was a very ordinary household. My dad worked at the pit, not as a miner, as a bricklayer. My mum was a stay-at-home mum until she went and trained to teach when we were about 11. Um, very ordinary schools, uh, brought up in the Catholic system and therefore travelled to school. Weren't schooled with our peers, were schooled elsewhere. but. Schooled in comprehensive schooling, non-selective, and your viewers won't know this, but the West Riding of Yorkshire was famous for very three-dimensional human education of the whole child, um, with a hope that you would then aspire and achieve, um, because you were being taught as a whole human being, not just to pass tests or whatever. So I refused to sit the 11 plus and went to a comprehensive school, and then on to a sixth form college, and then the shock of my life uh, at Cambridge University. Uh, <laughs> I, I wanted to t t touch on something you mentioned there, refusing to take the 11 plus. Well, it's quite a bold thing and quite a statement for an 11-year-old to, to make. Why did you want, not want to do it, I should say? Um, the nearest Catholic grammar school was all girls, point number one against <laughs> it. Um, the uniform was horrible, point number two. And it was an hour and ten minutes either way on several buses. And it would have completely stopped me from doing what I really wanted to do, which was to be a member of a choir, to play the piano, to be with my friends, to walk the woodlands around our home. Because mining villages are famous for the industry being in the middle of them and then surrounded by farmland and by open space. So, I mean, it sounds a bit like an Enid Blyton childhood. It wasn't at all. Um, we had very little spare cash. Um, Holidays were kind of homegrown, uh, self-catering in nearby seaside towns and so on. Um, but there was an expectation in my community that you were part of what the community did. So you did learn party pieces and you did join <laughs> choirs and you did um, sing and you did take part in community activities. Um, and your dad did grow gladioli and dahlias between the cabbages and the carrots and the rhubarb um, and valued all of them just the same. And there was kind of an expectation that you were brought up to be a rounded human being. Um, was there not an expectation that you might want to strive to, to do the best you possibly could, which at that time people would have said was the grammar school system? Um, there was a huge aspiration at home. Um, they weren't pushy parents, but uh, their line was, you can choose to do with your life whatever it is you decide. If you're going to be a wallpaper hanger or a hairdresser or a street sweeper, you need to be able to look, in your, look in, at your face in the mirror and say, I'm the best at this that there's ever been. So as long as you can say that, we'll back you 100%. Um, the expectation was that you would strive, that you would do your absolute level best in everything you did. Um, and the wonder of the choice of not sitting an exam at 11 that decided your future um, was, I think, the greatest gift. Um, it was a small comprehensive school that we went to. Um, it wasn't big enough to stream or set, so we were taught mixed ability. Um, there was an expectation that you would be socially active at the school as well, that you would play sport, that you would take part in drama, that you would go on visits, that if a poet came into school, you'd work with them. So the roundedness of my education and upbringing, I think, prepared me to be the person I am, to be honest. It also gives you, <laughs> growing up in a mining community, um, we lived through the 74 and 75 strikes and the power cuts and the three day weeks and the th going on to free school meals and all of those things. The sense of social justice that it inculcates in you, I've never belonged to a political party, but that sense of striving because community matters and the weakest among you has to be looked after has been one of the things that's driven me 
Now, you mentioned going to Cambridge, shock of your life. Uh, tell me about the getting in, and presumably also the cultural shock from a small mining village to Cambridge. It's a hot house academia, but also people from extremely different backgrounds there. Yeah, I mean, I'm part of that generation that didn't get in on their A-level results. You had to sit separate entrance exams. And I vividly remember sitting in uh, part of the common room at my sixth form college and sitting these exams and thinking, what on earth do you think you're doing? Um, to get into read history, you had to do a French paper. <laughs> Go figure. Um, and I was very surprised to be called for interview because I knew that my papers weren't wonderful. And Newnham College, which is, uh, I'm still very fondly attached to Newnham, um, and it was the college that called me for interview, and it was all girls then, and it still is. And my then, the woman who became my director of studies, uh, sat in her regal splendour with her half-moon spectacles on the end of her nose and said, you do realise your papers were very poor. And I thought, stuff this. <laughs> so I just looked at her and said, and yet you paid my train fare. <laughs> <laughs> she said, oh. and I, they let me in on cheek. They offered me a place on the basis of two grade E's <laughs> at A-level. Two grade E's. Extraordinary. <laughs> <laughs> and I accepted the place and then, certainly for the first term, really struggled. Didn't know what they wanted, didn't know where I fitted in, um, didn't know what their requirements were at all, really. The leap from A-level into first year undergraduate study is massive wherever you go. Um, in the hot house that is Cambridge, it's spectacularly so. And I came home at the end of November and threatened not to go back. And my dad said, then you'd better get a job. <laughs> <laughs> so I changed my mind. <laughs> Kept you there. And it clicked. Somehow. Somehow it clicked. And then I had a whale of a time for oh. my second and third years. And was it, was it there that you decided you wanted to go into education, go into working with, with children at you know, various stages? I think it had always been at the back of my mind that teaching was what I really wanted to do. Um, the chance to do a Cambridge degree was too big a chance to pass up. Um, but then training to teach, uh, I went to Sheffield to train to teach, went back to the north and the quality of the postgraduate certificate at Sheffield was second to none, really, really good. Um, and then the chutzpah that Cambridge gives you, there weren't any history jobs so I applied for an English job and got it. And <laughs> you think, oh, damn cheek. Um, and then fell on my feet in a succession of moves. Um, first school I taught in was brand new, so they were recruiting a whole cohort of brand new teachers every year for four years, and I was part of one of those. It was vibrant, it was young, the staff were amazing, you got responsibility really quickly. Um, the kids were very hard work and that really honed your teaching muscles. They weren't going to be impressed by anything you did. So <laughs> And when you look back where you where you are now, how important was that early stint, you know, working with those those kids who weren't giving you any sort of any slack, as it were? Children will always keep you on your toes. I don't care who they are or what circumstances they have been brought up in or lived in or are schooled in. Um, it's almost that in the job description of being a child that you push the boundaries. Um, and I've met them in all sorts of settings, from asylum centres to public schools and all the way between those two. Um, and the job of a child is to puncture your pomposity and to ask you the questions that you'd rather not answer and to look at the world through a very different lens from you as an adult. Um, and, and to be cheeky and irreverent and um, not to stand on ceremony. They keep you young, children. Now, it's obviously not that long ago that you were teaching, but um, when the sort of general feeling in many quarters of the media is that education standards have gone down, we're, we're not as good as we were, exams are easier, kids aren't having to learn so hard. When you look back now, do you, how do you feel that education has changed over those years and where are we now in comparison to when you started? I don't think there's any evidence for standards having, having fallen, to be honest. Um, 
GCSE questions these days are harder than A-level questions were 10 years ago. And A-level students are dealing with things I dealt with in my first year at university. Um, they are living in a fast-paced, massively demanding world um, that expects everything of them and sets them ideals with which some of them really struggle and suffer. So airbrushed bodies and celebrity lifestyles and um, champagne holidays and so on and so on come through the feed of every piece of technology they pick up um, in ways that was never the case when I was a child. I wouldn't want to be young again. I think it's a real struggle for a lot of youngsters. Uh, I want to talk to you much more about that issue in just a moment. Professor Maggie Atkinson, do stick with us because we're going to have a very short break here on the headline interview and we'll hear more about Professor Atkinson's fascinating career. Welcome back to the Headline Interview with me, Luke Blackall. My guest today is the former Children's Commissioner, Professor Maggie Atkinson. Um, now, we were just talking before the break, you were saying you just wouldn't want to be a, a young person today. And there has been research recently about how some of the UK's children are some of the un most unhappy in the world. Um, why, why do you think that is? Um, I think the pace of life is one issue. I think we are slower than we ought to be at picking up on children's anxieties. Um, I don't think we are a particularly broken society in the ways that some very biased research would indicate for children and young people. I just don't think we're very supportive of their need sometimes for downtime, just to be a child, to rest, to play, to spend time with their friends. They are hugely over-examined and over-tested from the very earliest points in school. There is something to be said for a European system where your early years are learning entirely through play and then you become a formal learner much later. Um, we are very picky about what we learn from other nations. So we're about to start testing them all over again on times tables all the way to 12 in a metric system. Go figure. Oh, and I was going to ask you about that because the exams are going to change, we hear. Like you said, times table coming back, familiar for lots of us. Um, you know, what do you make of those proposals? We've never stopped teaching the times tables. They learn the times tables in what is now year four, when they're nine, going on ten. Um, and they continue to rehearse and practice them all the way through. Uh, the new test is going to be timed, computer-based, um, very kind of production line is how it feels in the way it's being described. No other nation against which we compete does that to its children. Not the Chinese, not the Finns, not anybody. And you think, Where's that come from? Why is that necessary? They do learn their times tables, of course they do. And it's necessary, it's very important. But we are obsessed with, if it moves, test it. It's not the way to make a child learn. And is that, do you think, coming from people without an educational background? Just a sort of belief or a memory of what they did as, as a young person? I think that's part of it. I also think that um, it's very easy to sit and have an idea or to listen to people who've had a bright idea somewhere without necessarily having walked around a school and talked to some very experienced head teachers and governors and class teachers about what it will mean. And listen to the profession is one of the things that we hear on a regular basis. They're very stressed and very overloaded teachers. Um, but children also need what a new direction promotes, which is access to culture and the arts and things that make your brain work differently so that when you come back to your maths, you've re-exercised your brain and you're ready. I mean, we mentioned New Direction there, you're chair of that organisation. Now, it's, you know, we're in London, there's a wealth of opportunity in the arts, we cover lots of it here on London Live, but do you think it reaches the, the children it often needs to reach? What all the research tells us is that uh, children who wouldn't naturally wander into um, the museums or the galleries need to be brought into them by the adults in their lives. And if it's not going to happen from home because home is hugely pressurised or there's a struggle to put food on the table and keep the roof over your head, uh, then the natural place to do it is through schools. Um, and there are lots of schools in Lond London which are taking arts and culture as the heart of what they do with their children and young people. 
right out in the outer London boroughs at the ends of all the tube lines as well as in the inner London boroughs where access to cultural facilities is, is better. Um, we need as a city to own the fact that our poorest, furthest flung at the far ends of long tube lines uh, or long bus routes are the children who do least in terms of accessing the glories that are in this city because it is a world leading city for all sorts of reasons. Now you mentioned um, in the last part you were talking about your upbringing and a community expected you and it's, and it's very good to have a school but a school's only with a child a certain amount of day, individual teachers even smaller no amount of day. How much education, how much sort of pressure do you, do you think needs to be put on parents to encourage this and to, and to promote these ideas so that at the weekend and the evenings and the mornings before school, that sort of cultural education is reaching children? I think, that, again, there are schools that are also doing that, that are sending poems home, that are sending simple musical instruments home or songs that the family can learn together, um, that are asking grandad to tell the stories of what it was like when he was a boy or grandma to talk about what her childhood was like and what school was like and bringing those stories back in um, so that the family is very deeply involved. Um, but with the best will in the world, if you're a family on a very poor income, um, then actually your ability to get into places that may require you to pay, where you may also have to factor in buying a lunch or whatever, um, you will struggle as a family in those circumstances and it becomes something that drops to the bottom of the list if you have massive bills to pay and or school shoes to buy and or lunches to provide all week um, and the schools that are doing a curriculum that is very heavily based on arts and culture are finding that all of their results go up their maths their english their behavior their attendance the children's ability to concentrate at school if you are engaged in cultural activities and artistic activities, everything you do improves. I also wonder, is it, is it hard reaching the children who are growing up without English as a first language? We have a hugely multicultural society in London. A lot of children grow up in communities where sort of perhaps culture in Britain isn't so widely known and perhaps subjects that are more easily translatable are, are, are pushed. Do we need to try and reach those who perhaps don't have a, a sort of a cultural background, the one assumed of going to, to cultural experiences here in London? Well, if you, th if you think about some of the exhibitions that happened in 2015 in, in London, if you think of the V&A and its gorgeous mm -hmm. exhibition of Indian fabrics, um, many of our third and fourth generation youngsters from the, the South Asian nations would probably have recognised those fabrics from celebratory events in their own lives and their own families and communities. It may take a leap of the imagination. Uh, where if I go back to my upbringing as a child, I was at school with children who had Polish and Ukrainian surnames because they came to work the mines after the Second World War and there was therefore a settled community. And they wore their national dress on spe special days and they danced and they sang and they brought their culture into our cultures. Uh, in South Yorkshire and that's possible as well. We are a very richly multicultural city and much of what we've done has been won through trade and commerce with nations elsewhere. What a fantastic opportunity. Now you're obviously promoting cultural education for young people. It still remains, despite the fact you say it improves exam results, it remains unfashionable. You yourself have battled uh, face battles not to only to get your job as children's commissioner but when I was researching you I found um, people calling you a caricature bleeding heart liberal you know co controversial appointment are you prepared that this is good you know you'll you'll we'll have to you know bash them heads together knock down doors to get this message that you're promoting now through to the people in power I, I think when you have a passion for something, um, you'll take the knocks, you know. I'm, I'm uh, a big girl and I used to be a very senior teacher and I've dealt with bigger teenagers than most of the politicians on the patch. And both mayoral candidates are interested in this agenda, both the main parties' mayoral candidates. Um, it's going to be a really exciting year for London. And uh, you take the knocks. When you have difficult conversations, you take the knocks. Um, more of a bleeding heart liberal than, than um, some people may be, but uh, steely. <laughs> um, you mentioned the mayoral campaign. Um, you ha say you have these 
these front runners in front of you. Maybe you will get a chance to talk to them, I don't know. But what would you be saying to them? What were you saying that they need to address when it comes to young people in London? Well, they have influence on education rather than power over it, uh, the London Mayor. Um, but that influence is really important. Um, they come from very interesting cultural backgrounds, those two main candidates from the two big main parties. Um, and they love London. And I've no doubt at all that they're in contact with the cultural establishments and the National Trust properties and the parks and so on. And it's about really them being prepared, whichever of them gets the role, um, to stand square with the children of this city. One in six jobs in London is in the cultural industries, whether it's behind the scenes or in front of the cameras, whether it's producing or performing. Um, the cultural industries bring in billions of pounds to the UK economy. Cultural industries are growing faster than any other sector. Um, London is famous for its amazing cultural artefacts and its amazing art. Um, and it's amazing theatre and music as well. And what it needs to do is to see that only the adults having it is actually no way to go. If you want a new generation to help you lead it, then everybody has to get involved. And the mayor can give great leadership and great kudos to those issues, and should. I say a huge thank you to you, Professor Maggie Atkinson. Thank you very much for your thoughts today. Sadly, that's all we have time for on the headline interview. My thanks again to my guest, Professor Maggie Atkinson, who is the chair of the organisation A New Direction, which promotes and encourages children and young people's engagement with the culture and arts of the capital. Like I said, that's all we've got time for. See you again next time on the headline interview.